Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Where we begin this afternoon with the somber note that I will not be running for re-election of Rotary. I'm standing down so a younger, more attractive, and smarter woman can succeed me next year. So, welcome to Rotary, where today we are celebrating National Drive-In Food Restaurant Day. Susan Manuel, Suzanne Manuel, could you come up and do the invocation and pledge for us? Sorry, everybody was talking to me. Oh, you're important. I'm just on. Good to see you. Well, hello, my dear friends. Today, the Rotary Word of the Day is inspiration. For 20 years, as I walk in the door to a Rotary meeting, or we go to a social or a committee meeting, I see these wonderful faces that just make my life and uh, the world so much better. Uh, I look around this room and your kindness, your friendship, your generosity, your, your heart for service is so inspiring to, to me and to everyone. You really do make a difference. Uh, whether we're delivering food down at the food pantry or Fisher House, whether we're cleaning the beach, uh, whether we're trying to get rid of polio, we all work so well together, and it's just so inspirational to be with you all. Um, we talk about magic, too, in Rotary. I'm going to tell you the magic in Rotary is not in Evanston. It's right in this room with every one of you. You are all magic, and uh, I'm just so proud to be a part of this club. To quote Martin Luther King, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Well, we know in this room, we know what we're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rotary. Please join me in the pledge. Oh. 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 One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, next on our agenda is Julie Gallagher. Julie, where are you? Come on up here and introduce the visiting Rotarians and our guests. Well, thank you, President Pat, and welcome to everyone. Uh, we have two visiting Rotarians today. One uh, has the classification of casino and uh, hails from Las Vegas and his name is Gary Voss Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. <laughs> and our second uh, special Rotarian visiting today um, has the classification special projects and he is from Placentia Rotary and his name is David Muirhead and now we would love for any Rotarians who have guests visiting to introduce them to us. I would like to introduce our very special guest, Shannon Pavel, who works for Sharp Coronado for their foundation. She is here to accompany our speaker. Thank you for being here. President Pat and fellow Rotarians, it's my pleasure to introduce my guest today, Robson Winter, who is the uh, uh, geographic staff representative for Assemblywoman Tasha Barner's office, and he's joining us today from, uh, from her office. Oh, I'm, I'm, I was going to say, you know, he's a fellow Rotor actor. President Pat, fellow Rotarians and guests, I am uh, standing in for Karen Strabel today, and I want to introduce her special guest, Shannon Canoe, and uh, please give him a welcoming applause, okay? President Pat, fellow Rotarians and guests, it's my pleasure to introduce Judy Weissman. Judy is the president of the Coronado Hospital Foundation Board and a guest of our President Pat. Uh, it's, again, my distinct honor to introduce my lovely wife, Molly. Hey, 
Okay, we have red badgers with us today. Uh, we're going to go through these slowly. Uh, first, we have Josie Cushing. Where are you? Jo tell us what your favorite vacation spot is. Oh my goodness, Hawaii. Very good. Mark Fleming. Same question. Ireland. Ireland. Oh. Julie Gallagher. Julie. The archipelago of Sweden. Oh. Kevin Kenny, Kevin? What is that? Ireland. And Kathy McDonald. Spain. Spain. So when you get a chance, visit with these folks about where their favorite vacation spots are, because they're probably your favorite spots also. Yeah. All right, updates and announcements. Let's see. Um, first we're gonna have Sarah come and talk to us about N Polio Now. Sarah, where are you? Sarah, Jacqueline? Thank you, President Pat. This is your beautiful and Polio Now Committee. We met last night, so that's a picture very recently taken. Uh, well, we wanted to do a few things today, but one is, for those of you that haven't been to the wine tasting event that we do, we wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to see what that looks like. So, um, Joe, can you run the video from last year?
Go to the next slide, please. So, just so you know how it spreads, it's a fecal to oral transmission. It's because of a lot of contaminated food, water, and um, even you can get it from a surface. And you can imagine in the third world countries, this is a lot more common than we do. A lot of it is poor sanitation and poor hygiene. Prevention and education, obviously, we're delivering the vaccines. We're trying to teach good hygiene, and uh, a lot of places other than us also are trying to help get good water to those places so it does not spread. Um, and also, healthcare is needed to support those that have gotten polio and have been paralyzed. The next slide, please. So, the magic of Rotary. The magic of Rotary is back in 1988, there were 350,000 cases of polio a year. And now there are 17 on year to date, 2024. You can see what we as a, a club have done, which is significant. Last year we did 127,000, and that increased to 381,000 with the help of the Gates Foundation, who does a two to one match. Rotary International, 150 million to 450 million. And Rotary International, since 1988, $2.6 billion. So this is the magic of Rotary. Next slide, please. So one little piece of news that you may have seen in the news, maybe, maybe not, is there is a nervousness about polio getting into Gaza. And you can see even in this picture that we pulled, their, their um, situation is deplorable and the sanitation systems are broken. And it's such a large concern that the Israeli army has vaccines and they don't have to take it, but the army is um, trying to make them do it because they're in the Gaza area. So you can see that it's really serious and they're on alert for hoping to stop that. Next slide, please. So just so you know, when you donate to Rotary, here's a kind of a breakout of where your money is going. About $39 for each 100 goes to vaccinate the children, um, 24 to go to raising awareness, and that's not only to the families that need it, but it's the people that need to deploy it. Because in a lot of countries, like men cannot go to the houses to deliver the vaccine. It has to be women, of the same cultural orientation that can go into houses. So we've got to raise awareness and get people to be willing to go in and do it. Um, they spend money detecting the polio virus, so they detect it from uh, um, feces and from the water so that they can stop an outbreak. They know where it's happening and they can get on top of it. And uh, for funding experts and then research, which is critical. Next one, slide, please. So why donate now? Actually, there was a statistic, we stopped giving vaccines now. In 10 years, 200,000 children a year would get polio. So we can't stop, it's not eradicated yet. And once you stop, it, it, it impedes in there. So um, I would like um, the, sorry about that, the end polio now community to stand up. Can you stand up? We have the best group of people who are creative, energetic, and dedicated. And they are putting on the best um, and polio now event this year than we've ever seen. It's going to be so exciting. So we're really excited. Thank you for all of your time and creativity. And we look forward to, to you all coming and donating. All right. So here's some details on this year's event. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jill. All right. It starts today. If you want to get your tickets today, and I highly encourage you to do so because it sells out every year. We only let 140 people in. Um, you can go and buy your ticket today. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can go to Coronado Rotary Wine Tasting dot Charity. That's our website that's up and running. You can learn more about polio, some of the things that Sarah talked about, but also some other information. You can register there as well. You can donate there. And on August 21st, you can even bid on some auction items that will be listed there. But we'll talk about that more on August 21st, so you'll learn about that. Uh, you can also go get your tickets by going to the Rotary calendar and just finding the date, September 6th, and going in that way. So either way works. And it's, the sign-up is very much like you did for today. You go in and you register just like you would for one of our lunches. It's very, very easy. September 6th at Jim Kaufman's house. Thank you again, Jim. Uh, 6 p.m. We'll all be there. We'll all be having a great time. We've got some great wineries lined up. We have some beer, as always. Thank you. Uh, and we're just going to have some great fun, some amazing auction items. I'm not going to say any of them today. You're going to have to wait until August 21st to hear about them. But let me just say, there's going to be some heavy bidding going on because there's some amazing auction items this year, thanks to the, the generosity of many of the Rotarians that are sitting in this room today. So 
when you get a chance, go in there, try to register. If you have any issues, let us know. We look forward to seeing you. Good job. Thank you for me to tell you how much the tickets are. But that's not the fun part. Uh, the tickets are $135 each this year. So that's uh, $10 more than last year to help cover some of the costs of, that we are incurring. Thank you. There's a lot of enthusiasm in that committee, and they have worked very, very hard. Um, so we, we had we have a bunch of pictures of things that have been going on. Joe, if you could run through those for me. We had the alternate meeting, and there was something terrible that happened at the alternate meeting, and we'll come back and find somebody for that in just a minute. And then, let's see, we had the beach cleanup, uh, which always needs it. lots of dedicated folks. Appreciate that. Then... Moving on to the next one. I want to go see the list of candidates. This is a problem. This is a problem. So it was brought to my attention that there are a total of eight people running for office in Cordata right now. Four from city council and two from for mayor just happen to be Rotarians. What I want to know is What's the matter with those other two people? <laughs> Why hasn't somebody brought one of them as a guest here? But it does lead me to an important point, which is all of these people are our friends, and we want all of them to be successful. And we try to be a nonpartisan group, meaning we, are all have, we all have our favorites, but you just can't wear somebody's campaign literature to an alternate meeting. And you're responsible for your guests, John Charles. So that's about a $25 fine. Now, the other thing I want to point out about this list is, if your name's not on this list, you need to get a dollar out and put it in the bucket right in the middle. Huh? You just, you just, look at these people have stepped up. But they, they don't have to pay for that. Next slide. They have to pay for other things, like... Amy Stewart and Andrew Gage being out here getting in the newspaper, that's a finable offense. Uh, that's a finable offense for doing good, but we thank you. And then the next one, and he's not here, but I think I'm going to double his fine for this. The next one is, what's the fine for having your three kids on the front page of a magazine? What's that, what's that about? So we'll hit John up for a bunch of money because he deserves that. He deserves the pay. Um, all right, uh, on a more, a more somber note, and I, and I don't want to miss this because it was just told to me. Many of you knew Georgia Ellis, who is a longtime member of our club. Georgia passed last night, just for those. We don't have any details on services or anything, but I just want you to be aware of that. So, having said all that, and having stuck all that money in the middle, I'm going to take just a minute Chris Clevers, if you would come up and tell folks what that money in that bucket's going for, please. Thank you very much, President Pat, and thank you, Rotarians. Um, you've seen these little buckets around, the little small buckets, if you want to take them home and fill them up. This is CART, Coins for All, Alzheimer's Research Trust. It's a group uh, that is administered by Rotarians. There are over 400 clubs in the country that have this program in place. More on the East Coast uh, than out West, although we're gonna work with that. I've spoken with incoming District Governor Luis Carranza, and that's gonna be a very big focus of his. The research is making a huge difference. They are making strides, not only with Alzheimer's, but also some of the related diseases, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia. Um, and as you look at the aging population of this country, it impacts you. Uh, I've spoken to a number of Rotarians. How many of you have been impacted by Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, or uh, Lewy body dementia? Just look around. Hope it's not going to be me. But you know what? Uh, we're going to we're going to fight this battle. So also our cards. If you want to make individual pledges directly to the card fund, 100 percent of any money that goes in these buckets or that is donated goes to Alzheimer's research. As an example, last year. They awarded $1.9 million, which is about seven grants, usually in the two hundred fifty dollars to $350,000. And this is seed money for promising researchers who say, hey, I've got, an, I've got an idea for an acorn. 
and let's grow that into an oak tree and let's get this disease under control. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. Uh, even a penny makes a difference. So shake the piggy banks, whatever you would like. Uh, it is deeply appreciated and put to use. Oops, sorry. <laughs> put to use very effectively. Thank you. Thanks, I just appreciate it. So that's, that's where that dollar you just donated goes. So it's going for a good cause. We appreciate your work on this, Chris. Thank you. All right. In keeping with our, our new tradition, we have a, a program we're doing called Who Was I That I'm Amending to Be and Who Will I Be? So this week we've asked we've asked Bob Cyberson. Bob, where are you? And he promised me he broke down his program from 20 minutes to two. And I told him he could do the last 18 minutes by himself in the bathroom. So, Bob, come up here and tell us who you were and who you plan to be this year. Thank you. Thank you, President Pam. Uh, yeah, we have time. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is Debbie's book. These are mine. These are mine. Can I put this in here? Yes. Yes, I can. Um, first of all, how many of you have been members of Rotary since September of 1991? Please raise your hand. It's before September. So I'm going to remind you that I'm Bob Cyberson. <laughs> For all of those who have joined subsequent to that date, I'm Debbie's husband, Bob Cyrus. Um, and as Dan Orr, where's Dan? Right here. As he has so eloquently written in the Corator, which, by the way, makes me think he went to San Diego State, um, De Debbie gives a cybernesk, cyberquest, or whatever, cybernesk type presentations when she gets up. Well, now you're going to know where she got. She's fearless. She'll stand up and talk about anything, any subject, you just ask her if you need a speaker anytime, anywhere. Her, she's fearless, and she's part of who I am. I want you to know that. That's all I got to be, Debbie's husband, Bob. But the, the difficulty when you're asked to do who am I, and you're told you got two minutes, by the time you explain why it takes longer than two minutes, it's 90 <laughs> seconds or more. So I'm a Rotarian of 32 years. I am one believe it or not, of the most trusted Rotarians in Coronado, and I have evidence of that, in that 150 families bring their precious little gifts to me and the team down at Chase to deliver on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Who would you trust with that? Me and the team. And that trust comes because we're with Rotary, and it's not something we take for granted. And the trust that you earn by being a Rotarian transfers into many other parts of your life. Um, Okay, I'm one of the familiar faces you see on the flag committee, going up and down, and I'm one of those guys that you don't see some of the good things I'm doing, and I'm not going to tell you what they are because that's why you don't see me. Um, but I also am a Rotarian in the roles that I volunteer for. Sharp Hospital Auxiliary, I am the treasurer of the Auxiliary. I work with the foster kids out at San Pasquale Academy another place where Rotary comes in, and, and when I can golf, the four-way test is definitely applied. <laughs> so, but now, for so those who have been here, they know me, so I'm going to go over real quick on who I am in my personal life. I'm a Mar Vista High School graduate, a San Diego State College graduate, a University of San Diego grad school graduate, a former CPA, moved to Coronado in 1987, my son graduated from CHS, and my wife is a Rotarian, and next two weeks from now, we'll have been married for 53 years. <laughs> How many here are under 52 years old? I'm not the father. <laughs> for the last 25 years, I have been a COFO, which Bob is going to understand, a Chief Operating Financial Officer Consultant. I bring my CPA experience into operating companies and try to help them out. So, President Pat, I've got to bring, he asked me to say something about Rotary instead of just me, but the thing about Rotary that I've seen over the last 32 years are very, very positive changes. The younger membership, can't, it, it, Rotary can't sustain itself with older members. It's a math thing. 
Um, and the number of opportunities Pat, President Pat presented last week that you can actually go and either participate in seeing how you can contribute or see how your contribution is working. And it's not just money, it's time, it's people feel good. I know with my work up at the academy, the kids are stunned that people care about them. So whatever you're doing in Rotary, when someone sees you doing it with your little vest on, that, that's a big deal. They, they care that you're doing it. So who am I? I'm one who doesn't always go to the meetings. Believe it or not, I know most of you see me here. Uh, I'm serious only part of the time. And uh, I'm most proud of being Debbie's husband, Bob. Aww. What, what do we do with the uh, minute and 15 seconds over your two minutes? Do you have more time? No, no, no you're, you're running a deficit, but we're used to that in this country. Um, so, as I mentioned when we first started, today is National Drive-In Restaurant Day. Let's celebrate that. And to celebrate it, I have a gift coupon for $25 to In-N-Out Burger, which I'm going to give to none other than Tom Edison, who is the longest serving Rotarian in the club who joined in July. And who's here. What have I missed? Something, I'm sure. At this point in time, we have Jane Brown who's going to come up and introduce our guest speaker. Jane? It is my privilege to introduce Fad Benjalil tonight today. He's a Rotarian, so many of you know Fad already. But just to give you a little update, he serves currently as the Chief Financial and Operating Officer for Sharp Coronado Hospital. He spent a decade in the corporate finance industry and joined Sharp Grossmont uh, approximately in 2011. His efforts there and reputation for integrity led to his current position as the Sharp Coronado CFO, COO. In addition to his finance and operations experience, Fod holds a Six Sigma certification and is trained on the principles of a highly reliable organization, or highly reliability, which we want in a hospital. Yes. Fa holds a Bachelor of Science in Finance and Masters, and a Masters of Business Administration in Finance from National University in San Diego and he is proud of his recent U.S. naturalization from his home country of Morocco. Wow. Fad and his wife live in La Mesa. They have a daughter who is 14 and two young boys, nine and eight years old. They're 17 months apart. I can't imagine what his husband is like. Fad, come on up. President Pat, fellow returns, thank you for the privilege of being here today. Uh, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. So Jane gave a little bit of an introduction of who I am. Uh, I've been a Rotarian now for, I don't know, three, four years. I don't make it enough to the meetings. And I was just reminded that it's a good place to have a good lunch and step away from the hospital. So I will do my best to co come more often. Uh, go to the next slide. We can skip the next slide since you did the introduction, so just go to the next slide after that. So uh, to, today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the uh, robotics capabilities for uh, Sharp Coronado. I'm going to talk a little bit about Sharp Healthcare overall, and then we'll focus on Sharp Coronado and the technology that we are bringing forward, and then we continue to expand our services. So uh, a little bit about Sharp, you know, our vision and mission is to uh, better the community that we serve here in San Diego, uh, and we try to transform ourselves and uh, to become the best that we can, best place to play, to practice medicine, best place to receive care, and the best place to work. And we try to do that with everybody that we work with. So next slide. So a little bit about the robotics within Sharp Healthcare. 
So we do uh, robotic surgeries for uh, different specialties, but we do general surgery, cardiothoracic, ENT, bariatric, also orthopedic surgery. In total, within Sharp Healthcare, we have over 27 Da Vinci robots. We are the leader in the San Diego market, and we also have two Makoplasty, which is the orthopedic robots, one of which is at Coronado, the other one is at Sharp Grossman. And those two robots are being used for joint replacement. Today, I'll focus more on the Da Vinci part of the robotics program. Uh, so we have over 90 plus Da Vinci surgeons within Sharp Healthcare, and to date we've done over 35,000 procedures. Next slide, please. So overall, Sharp Healthcare is the leader in minimally invasive surgery. Uh, we are we today we have about almost 90% of our uh, surgeries are minimally invasive. The national average is at 71%, and we still have opportunities to continue to uh, improve and increase that number. What this means is with minimally invasive surgery, there is less recovery time, and which allows our patients to go back to do what they want to do, be with their families, play golf, come to our early meeting, and so that's the future of, uh, of robotics. Next slide. Now, I am extremely proud to say that at Sharp Coronado, we are 96% minimally invasive, which means for every 100 patients that come, 96 of them get minimally invasive surgery. Now, there's still some certain surgeries that have to be done uh, open that cannot be done robotic because they're too complex, but we're extremely proud of that number. Wow. So next slide. So how did Sharp Healthcare and Sharp Corrado become the leader in robotic surgery? So. I'll share this. We've had robots across Sharp Healthcare since 2014, but we never had a robotics program. And it wasn't until probably 2018, 2019 that we started like focusing on robotics program. Now at Sharp Coronado, we were innovators and the leaders in that sense. So uh, back in 2017, we were building the Pain Family Outpatient Pavilion, and uh, we were deciding and debating with the, our own Susan Stone, what are we gonna do, uh, what type of surgery are we gonna bring, what type of services are we gonna offer. So back then, we were approached with, by two surgeons that used to practice at Sharp Memorial and did not have as much access to robotics as they would wish. So they said to us, if you buy us a robot, we will bring volume. So as a finance person, when a surgeon comes to me and says, buy me a toy and I'll bring you the volume, my answer is, bring me the volume, show me you can do it and I'll buy you the toy. <laughs> that being said, we took a leap of faith in this instance and we worked with our foundation and we were able to raise funds extremely quickly to purchase our first robot. So we did get a first robot in 2018, uh, early 2018, and we had three surgeons, or actually yeah, two, three surgeons that were interested in doing that. And they came in and they said, we'll bring you X amount of cases per month if you get us a, a robot. So back then we built the business plan to pay back the robot uh, in two years. And we actually paid it back in 10 months. That's how quickly our robot, and I have a few charts that will show that. So when we built the Pain Family Outpatient Pavilion, even though it's called an outpatient pavilion, what we actually did is we licensed it as an inpatient and outpatient surgical uh, ORs to give us the flexibility to do whatever types of cases we wanted there. So it is called an outpatient pavilion, but we can also do inpatient services there. Our main focus with Da Vinci is outpatient surgeries, and we do primarily general surgery. So we do uh, cholecystectomies, hernia repairs, um, appendectomies, as well as some bariatric surgeries with the robot. So next slide, please. So what you can see here is a growth of our robotics program at Coronado. So we started with that one robot in late, 20, in late 2017, early 2018. We today have four Da Vinci robot, three XIs, which is the model, and then the DV5, which is the latest technology that I'll share a video about today. Uh, I'm happy to say that not many hospitals in the world have the privilege to say they own a DV5, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Today we have 10, over 10 Da Vinci surgeons that come in and do a lot of surgeries 
We do over 320 cases per robot per year. And we primarily outpatient. And the one thing that attracts our surgeons and retain them is our ability to have uh, a quick turnaround. And what I mean by that is surgeons have families, surgeons want to play golf, they want to go to a rotary meeting. But what happens is when they come in and they start a case, when they're done, there is a room turnover that happens. Well, I'm proud to say that Sharp Coronado is a leader in this instance. We are example that quite often we're asked how we do it. Our turnover of an OR room for a robotic case is between 15 and 20 minutes. Wow. The national average is between 45 minutes to an hour. So a lot of hard work is being put in place and our surgeons love that because what happens is they can come to the hospital, they do all their cases, they see their patients, they do their charting, and they're able to go home at a decent time to have dinner with their families. So they love that. Uh, another thing that we do also is we hold physicians accountable for on-time start. That's also a big thing in surgery because if the first case starts late, then you have delays throughout the day. So we hold everybody accountable. Uh, one of the other things that's also been amazing within Sharp Healthcare is we are uh, a leader in access. So we provide access 24-7 to robotics. And what that means is if you came in through the ER at three in the morning, you still have the ability to receive robotic surgeries. A lot of health systems in the country have not moved to that direction. So if you come in during the day, you're, you're a, uh, a case that was referred to the hospital for a hernia repair and whatnot, you'll get robotics. But if you came in through the ED at three in the morning, the likelihood that you'll have a, robot, a robotic surgery is very slim to none. So we are leaders in that access as well. Uh, our ability at Coronado having that many robots is also the ability to flip rooms. And what that means is I can have a surgeon coming in, starting the case in this room, completing the case, then there is turnover, then they can go to the next room and it becomes more efficient. And usually we can flip rooms when we have multiple surgeons that do similar cases. So that's another thing that we're able to do at, um, at Coronado. I shared about generative surgery and bariatrics and those are the main specialties that we use at Coronado. Next slide. So how do we measure success, right? Success is not just in the number of cases that you do, but it also in the quality or the clinical outcomes that we do, as well as financial sustainability. So next slide. So what you'll see here is what we call pack your time, which is our recovery time for robotics uh, in, 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 uh, after the, the case is done in OWA. What you can see here is Coronado in comparison to the national average for uh, cholecystectomies and hernia repairs. We are extremely well placed. We are leaders in that sense. And that's driven by a multitude of things. It's driven by uh, the ability of our teams to provide our anesthesia teams to provide block, uh, block for anesthesia that allows less pain and quicker recovery. We also have one of the lowest opioid use in, in our ORs and Sharp is also a leader in that area as well. So when you look at this and you compare you know, our recovery time um, at Coronado compared to the national average, this is where I talk about financial sustainability, right? If I have a longer recovery time, there's two components there. Number one, the patient stays in the hospital longer, which requires additional staffing for the patients to be uh, uh, recovered with. Number two, from a quality perspective, we want our patients to go home as soon as possible. So I'll give you an example of uh, something that I have done over the last, uh, I would say, probably about a year and a half ago, is I wanted to ensure that I understood every steps that the patients go through. And so I shadowed one of our surgeons uh, through a Da Vinci, through a hernia repair, and I went from when the patient went in to uh, registered in the, in the pain family operation pavilion that went to get prepared for the surgery, got the surgery, recovered, and get discharged. And what that did to me is it opened up a whole other set of, I mean, it opened my eyes in a different fashion. I saw 
hands on all the steps that a patient take. Now, I didn't go out of there and say, well, you need to do this better, or you need to do that because I'm not the expert, they are. The teams, the frontline teams are the expert. But I sat there and I spent time with them and I understood a lot of the work they did. Now, when we fast forward to looking at the data we have here, this also shows the ability to be efficient in our ORs. Next slide, please. So when we look at OR time, and this is where it's very important. So with any technology or any new technology, there is a learning curve, right? So think of it, we got a new phone, we got a new computer, we have to learn differently. With the Da Vinci robot is the same way. So early on in the adoption of the robots, we have actually had high OR time utilization for the surgeons. But as time went on, we got a decrease and surgeons became more efficient. Now, when you see here average OR time, again, because our surgeons have had the ability to use the robots a multiple, multitude of times, they've gotten more efficient. So for us, when we look at hernia repairs, uh, our average OR time is shorter than the, the national average. Now, you might say, okay, well, maybe they're doing it faster. Is it as good? Well, when you look at conversion rates, which is a case that would convert from a robotics to either open or laparoscopic, our rates are also a lot lower than national average, which means our quality outcomes are pretty high as well. So next slide. This is the slide that I was talking about, um, efficiency in DOR. So if you click on it, it's gonna show a couple other things. So if you look from 2018 to 2023, and this is all data that we're able to capture out of the robot itself, we have the ability to see all those points are the number of times the surgeons have done cases and the time on the console. And it's helped us identify areas of improvement if there are any. But what I can say is that we've seen a 46% reduction in console time, which means the surgeons have gotten more efficient at it and gotten a lot faster at doing it. And so we've seen a reduction of 35 minutes uh, on the console. So what that also means is that either we can do more cases or we can be again more efficient and have the ability to have the surgeons be out of there on time. Next slide. So before we start this video, so we talked about the XI, which is the prior generation of the robot. The DV5 is the latest generation of the robot. And you'll hear in this video why this robot is such an amazing tool. Uh, one of the other things, and I'll talk about it a little bit after the video, is that the ability to have this robot at Coronado is just is short of amazing. So I'll let you go ahead and play the video and then I'll join in about three more minutes. Intuitive DaVinci 5 is our most advanced and integrated system ever. It's going to transform surgery for surgeons, care teams, and patients. Well, I've never seen anything like this before. Force feedback is a first of its kind technology. In preclinical trials, we're seeing up to 43% less force on tissue. That translates to gentler surgery for patients. Before we relied on visual cues primarily, but now with feedback, it does give you that extra sort of sense. Uh, it's not something I've seen with any other system. It's something we, we experience in open and laparoscopic surgery, but not robotic surgery. We're going to be able to control so many more things from the, the surgeon console now, which I think is really important. It's really an immersive experience that gives you a next level of control that you didn't have previously. The ergonomics, the ability for me to move the headset where my head goes in, and move it exactly where I want it to be in a variety of different positions. I think that really is gonna help uh, elongate my career and make surgery more comfortable. We are seeing DaVinci 5's capabilities result in faster surgery, which translates to our customer's ability to do more surgeries in the day. I think having the integrated new components will make the process of starting the case a lot more efficient. The insufflator being in the vision tower, is just a huge thing. We don't have multiple vendors within a tower, we literally can offer everything that we need for the patient under one umbrella. I think it will make rooms more organized, so it helps with the staffing. 
problem that we have and also helps to reduce the cost. Da Vinci 5 will help surgeons unlock new answers to surgical techniques and patient outcomes with unique and granular data. Da Vinci 5 connects more data than any other platform that I'm aware of and allows physicians and their administrators to link them to patient outcomes. This opens up an opportunity for years of innovation and years of things that are going to come next. I can't wait for surgeons to get their hands on this. Now we have a platform, an approach to do minimally invasive surgery that is beyond anything that we could have seen in those incremental improvements. And that is what's giving us the magnification, the stability, dexterity, ergonomics, precision, all of which are key for us to be able to provide the highest quality minimally invasive surgery that we can to our patients. We don't want to be behind in medicine. We need to be ahead. And that's what's really exciting about this next generation. All right, so a few key points that I'd like to point out. So if you go to the next slide, actually before you go to the next slide, a few key points. So you've heard them talk about the force feedback. And what that means is in the past with the, well, I shouldn't call it the past because it's still present. With the older generation robot, with the XI, for example, when you do a, a, a surgery, the surgeon sees, has visual cues over what they're doing, but they don't feel in their fingers like they're doing an open surgery. <coughs> with this, with the DV5, you have the force feedback so they can feel the tension they're putting on the tissue. So I got the privilege to try uh, the DV5 while it was still not FDA approved yet. And we had the ability to go in there. Uh, it was an interesting, it was in an, an enclosed trailer, hiding from everywhere, like top secret stuff. But we had the, I had the ability to go in and try the force feedback. And so imagine if you're pulling with your hands a, uh, a piece of suture, you can feel the tension, right? Now imagine sitting behind the screen, you're holding a joystick or two joysticks and you're doing that and you're having that same exact feeling. It is pretty amazing. Now, if you put that in the hands of a surgeon, the less force or pressure they're putting on the tissue, the faster the recovery and the less the pain. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing technology. Now, other things you heard the surgeon on the call or on the video talk about ergonomics, right? So the previous um, iteration of the robot, they're sitting on a console, but their back was hunched up a little bit. So it gives them a little bit more pain. With this one, the whole console moves, and so they can you know, be less in pain, or they can you know, practice longer and not have to really worry about a lot of their bodies. Now, another thing that is not mentioned here, which is very interesting, and you'll, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this, but the actual robot itself has a wireless charger for their phone. So as they sit on the console, they can put their phone on the console and it'll charge and don't have to worry about finding a charger. And then the chair itself is also very ergonomic. So the first feedback that I got from one of our first surgeons that tried this was, I love the chair and I love the wireless charger. <laughs> and my response to them was, did, I, did we just spend over $2 million buying you a wireless charger and a chair? Because we could have bought you a throne and a ton of wireless chargers. But the reality of it is, is the little things that provide that benefit to the surgeons. Now go to the next slide, please. So Sharp Coronado was one of the luckiest hospitals in the world. We were amongst the first hospital to get uh, a DV5. Our sister hospital, Sharp Memorial, did get the first commercially available uh, robot in the world, and they were the first ones to do the first case. Now, what I like to say is that their robot was part of a final FDA um, approval adjustments, like they were trialing all the cases. So Coronado was actually the first one to truly get the commercial. We, we got a little competitive amongst ourselves, but we're very excited to have that. So today we have three XIs and one DV5. And our goal is by probably end of next fiscal year or potentially early 2026 is convert all of the robots we have to DV5 so we have the latest and greatest technology. Mm -hmm. So just as a reminder, for Coronado we have five ORs 
and uh, we have a total of five robots. I have four Da Vinci's and one Macomplasty. So we were extremely lucky uh, to have had the ability to start with a robot in early 2017, 18, have the foresight to see what's coming forward. Uh, our first case on the DV5 was uh, done by Dr. Bench on May 9th, and I had the privilege to shadow the case as well, just because I like seeing, I mean, I like being there. Uh, again, the positive feedback that we receive from the surgeons is that it's a lot more ergonomic, I can feel what I'm doing, and what we've seen in the last two months is we've seen the ability of that, remember that chart that I showed with the efficiency going down? Well, with this new technology, it's even more efficient. Now, another thing that was shared in the video, which is also important, is the ability to have all of the tools integrated within the, the Da Vinci 5. What it means is you have, you don't have, to, you can gain space efficiencies. Uh, for those who have been in an OR, hopefully not many, but for those who have been in OR, it looks cluttered. It looks like there's a lot of cables, a lot of stuff in the OR. So with this ability, it makes the rooms more efficient. Uh, and then I, I mentioned that we had the ability to change all of our excise for GV5 in the future. So next slide. So one of the things that we're very proud of at Sharp Healthcare is that we are the only healthcare system in Southern California to have received the recognition as a network of excellence. And what that means is that every single one of our hospitals are centers of excellence. Uh, what this also means is that we have the ability to showcase what we do. Uh, we go uh, out, we have actually uh, healthcare systems throughout the country that come to Sharp to see what we do with robotics. So all hospitals are our are, are, uh, centers of excellence. We have had the ability to make uh, many of our surgeons surgeons of excellence, so that's another, you know, tool and their belt to say I'm a surgeon of excellence part of a network so we're, we're very proud of, we're very proud of this uh, accomplishment as well so I think this concludes my slides I'll open it up to questions all right I love the hands all right let's who's going I think he was first is Medicare reimbursement the same for robotic surgery versus open surgery so the interesting thing is that so the way Medicare works, Medicare pays based on the type of procedures regardless of technology. So today, uh, uh, an open case gets the same reimbursement, sometimes a little bit higher than uh, a laparoscopic case or minimally invasive case. So there hasn't been a lot of payers that have adhered to the quality piece and say, we're, if you do it robotically, we're gonna pay you more. Uh, but today, it's primarily the same in terms of revenue. Jim? Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, when we change out the old ones for the new ones, is it an upgrade or do we just completely start over on the new ones and then what do we do with the old ones? Is there any trading value on those? So the beauty of where we are today at Sharp is we have partnered up with Intuitive, which is a company that uh, builds the robot. And we've, uh, uh, went into an agreement for what we call creative acquisition models. And what it does is, instead of us going and buying the robot like what we did in 2017, they give us the robot, obviously we have to qualify for them to give us the robot, and we pay on a per use basis. So for every case that we use the robot on, we pay them a fee. Now the beauty of that arrangement is that when new technology come up, I don't have to trade anything in. I just call them if they have it available. I give them the keys of that car, and I get a new car, a new robot back. No trading value, nothing. We just continue with the agreement. Hi. Okay. Uh, think so. so thank you. I'm curious about the operating room situation. When you have to transition from a minimally invasive to an open procedures, do you have to move rooms? No. So if one case has to convert. Uh, to an open case, usually it stays within the same OR and the case just converts and the, the surgeons just that. So it's the same surgeon that would that do the conversion. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, real, sorry, go ahead. Real quick testimonial. I had a, I had a double in one infirmity, hernia repair done by the Da Vinci with Dr. Bitch. I took one ibuprofen afterwards just because I thought I had to. 
Wow. Other than no pain. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, Tom. Full, full disclosure, I'm a retired urologist and uh, retired before the ro just as the robot was coming and becoming very popular. Where do you stand on urologic robotic surgery? Because urology was one of the first specialties that really took advantage of the robot. Um, with radical prostatectomies, nephrectomies, partial nephrectomies, because they were very advanced with laparoscopy and then with robotic surgery. And also, one of the uh, people mentioned uh, was a gynecologic surgeon, and the gynecologists are using the robot also. So where do we stand as far as just general surgery, but expanding to the other surgery specialties? So for us at Sharp Coronado right now, we're focusing on, uh, on general surgery and bariatric, but our sister hospital, Sharp Memorial, does a lot of gynecologic and urology as well. So we're definitely going in that direction. Uh, we have, in terms of uh, uh, gynecology, we have some surgeons of excellence that do all of their cases robotically, and also in terms of urology as well. So for Sharp Coronado specifically, we are trying to grow our urology service line, and obviously as time goes on and we have surgeons that, that want to do surgery with the robot at Coronado, we will open up time for that. So, here. I had the, oops, go ahead. Oh, go. I had the privilege last Thursday of having robotic surgery for a hernia, so I'm still in recovery. Uh, just kind of an interesting sidebar, I was called by the scheduler and they said, yes, we could probably do it at Sharp Coronado. I said, boy, that'd be lovely. They said, well, we can get you in in November. And I went, they said, but we can go to Sharp Tula Vista next week. Now, it's okay. I had a Wonderful experience at Sharp Tula Vista, but I was kind of sad I couldn't come to Coronado. But that's how busy you guys are. That's what I'm trying to say. So yeah, I appreciate that comment, and I think you're definitely right. Where we are busy, uh, our block time utilization. Uh, so the national average, or I would even say the national, just the local average for block time utilization, which is the amount of time surgeons spend in the OR, is usually between 50 to 60 percent we run at the high 70%. So we are extremely busy. All five of our ORs are busy. Uh, we are now working on a, I don't know for those of you who recall, back in the early 2000s, we had Project 2020 that got started. And the last part of that Project 2020 was the expansion of the emergency department and the relocation of the ICU, which was completed. So we're now in the process of looking at what the next 20 to 30 years of the hospital will look like. Uh, and in that process, we're building a master site plan with continued growth for the hospital, so hopefully we can get more ORs and be able to see more patients. What, what is it that the SHARP system did to impress upon either that Intua company or whomever it was to grant us that early access to these you know, high-end technology machines that other hospitals might not have done? So I, that's a great question. Uh, I think the biggest thing is the relationships. Uh, we've been able to build some strong relationships with Intuitive, which is the company that sells the robot. Uh, when we started with them back in 2014, as I mentioned, we had robots that we ran the program, and we quickly became a program. Now, Coronado was the catalyst for that because we had alignment between the executive team, the surgeons, and the operators, as well as intuitive. And as a, a, a health system, as we continue to expand and innovate and be more and more efficient, we were able to have intuitive sit with us and help us become better versions of ourselves. So it's in those relationships, plus the number of cases that we do, that we had the ability to get those uh, first robots. Uh, so, I'll, I'll give you an example. The day the robot was approved by the FDA, I had a contract in my hand that I had to sign very quickly in order for us to be amongst the first ones. And so, uh, again, for me and for the rest of our executive team is how do we continue to innovate and advance our hospital forward. So, that's what we did. Thank you. One more. Uh, this isn't a question, it's a comment that I think a lot of people in Coronado are not aware of. But Sharp Healthcare started here when Mr. and Mrs. Sharp donated their home and an entire city block to the Red Cross in World War II when their son was killed in the war. And that has grown 
from that start to what we see today, thanks to the Sharp family. Their house just recently sold again. Red Cross sold the property. The house was divided in two, and half of it just sold for $11 million. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much for being here. We don't need to remind her about the Rotary four-way test is, but everybody needs another coffee. Good. <laughs> So two things, uh, Dave, thank you for that eyewitness testimony. I know that you were there when that happened. We appreciate that. Uh, and and anybody, anybody who wants an explanation of whatever Howard's question was, he's going to stay off over his <laughs> With that, we'll see you next week at the, at the Cornell Cage Club for another exciting adventure of the best money in the universe. <laughs>